Hello, I'm Matt. And I'm Keith. And in this one, we'll be talking about how to sell handmade items and our experiences of doing commission work over the years. Just before that, though, Matt's going to talk about a website that he found recently that might be interesting to some of you following a previous episode we did about buying wood. We hope you enjoy the podcast. So we did a whole episode about buying wood and then I've seen ads for this pop up on Facebook and it's a website where you can list timber you want, timber that's for sale, um, trees that you have that you want someone to cut down. Really? And you've got to register and I'm sure it's UK only. But yeah, and it seems like quite a new idea. In fact, the, I had to go on an email about my registration saying that I was a founding member or something. So I imagine it's very new. But it could be really handy for finding wood locally that's from well not from sawmill mills more from people that have just chopped a tree down that sounds really cool so yeah that's uh timbermarket.co.uk so that i think that might be of interest to a few people so woodworking is an expensive hobby and me and keith we've talked about this before we both started it as a hobby but then you look at ways of funding it and think about selling your work so today we're going to look at a few of the options on how we've tried to actually make some money through woodworking over the years. So when people start hearing that you're a woodworker, I found that friends and family would ask for things. And to start with, I started just doing it for favours for people. But then when they want bigger things, you kind of have to charge them because materials are expensive, especially these days. So I think I started my first paid work with friends and family asking for things. How did you start actually selling things? Yeah, making things for friends and family is a really good place to start, I think. I think the first few things I made for for family were things like coffee tables, and that was a really good way of um, getting into cutting mortises and tenons and kind of learning the craft, knowing that somebody hasn't paid money for that item, so the pressure is off somewhat. One of the first commissions I did for money, I think, was a a kennel or a dog house for exterior use and I think that's one of the earlier videos on my channel and I purely did that project because I had materials left over from when I built my first workshop I had some shiplap and some timber that I could use and, e and even some roof felt so I made a dog house I put it on eBay and I think I sold it for 75 pounds or something which looking back I think they got a bit of a bargain really because an awful lot of time and effort went into making that um, at the time I was just happy just to um, sell it for some money because I didn't have a dog to go in the dog house so it seemed like a win-win yeah great and they're difficult to use up scraps those little bits of construction material I'm too mean to throw away that little bit of felt but what are you actually going to do with it so if you can find a project that uses up all those little bits because none of us have room to store all these things for years thinking one day we're going to actually use it do you remember what the first item you made as a paid commission was my family were running a pub in Hampshire at the time where I had my first workshop on film and I think I made quite a lot of bits for that. There was some kind of um, built-in seating, some banquette seating that went in a U-shape in an alcove, uh, some new table tops, bits like that. So again, it was paid work. I guess I did it mates rates, as in if you'd actually priced out doing this seating. If you'd got a company in, you'd probably win a couple of thousand pounds, but I probably did it for really just just over cost of materials but it's the first time that I even had done that everything else had been someone had asked for something and I'd gifted it to them and um yeah I, I'm terrible with friends and family if they ask for things I tend to just do it for them if it's small they just get it for free and if it's going to cost me you know 100 pounds of materials then I, I have to pass that cost on to them I'm not that rich or that nice and I think in the early days when you're just starting out, you're almost doing it more for your own benefit and your own experience and, and learning rather than actually making money out of it. That's certainly how I felt about it at the time anyway. Yes. But yeah, woodworking obviously is expensive with the materials. So if you can make something and it hasn't actually cost you anything to make it apart from your time, that kind of sometimes feels a bit of a win. 
but obviously better is to try and make some profit and then use that to buy some more tools and in fact i even know quite a few woodworkers who if they need a new tool to do the job they will price that tool into the job and that the job will pay for it and i think that's a really good way to expand your tool collection yeah certainly if it's a high paying job and a a large job it's easy to to lose a few hundred pounds for a new tool in there somewhere What about craft fairs, Matt? Have you ever set yourself up in a kind of sales environment where you can you can sell on the items that you've made? Well, I was forced into a craft fair um, when my it was my mum running the pub and someone locally was running a craft fair and they'd been in the pub and uh, telling my mum about it and she signed me up there and then and I'd never sold anything like that before, done anything like that. And it was about six weeks time. So I had six weeks to decide what I was going to sell, make it. I didn't have any more, anything more than kind of hand tools at the time. So I bought a, my record power bandsaw just for that purpose. I had to work out a display for it, uh, hire a friend to come and help me on the day. Yeah, it was a real drop everything and do it. But sometimes you need that little kick to get you started probably if she'd just come to me and said do you want to do a craft fair in six weeks I'd have gone oh there's no way no way I could be ready in six weeks but it wasn't hugely successful it was a Christmas one but it's the first time I'd ever done it in this small parade of shops so maybe 60 people turned up all day so it was not busy at all and I think I sold about 120 pounds worth of stuff but considering the hours I put in and the buying the tools and a full day and a full day of my friend waiting around um but they're still a good experience you still learn what people are interested in some products sold well others didn't but yeah and you've got to start somewhere what kind of items were you selling more boozy stuff i was doing beer crates so these little wooden crates that hold six bottles of beer in fact i think it was my first ever video was that so i sold a few of those but I think they were £25, so they were kind of high-ish price. And this is looking back, I don't know, six, seven years ago and before mobile card readers, so it was all cash. I think higher price items are easier these days because you can have a card reader and take payment. But if, if it's just the money people have in their pocket, I think if I'd done more maybe candle holders and chopping boards, more things around £10, £15, I probably would have done better. So have you ever done a craft fair? I haven't. I think in the earlier days when I first got started, um, the idea appealed to me. But because that was also the time that I kind of started my YouTube channel, I don't think I ever found the time to to make enough items um, to have available to to put on a craft stall. What was the experience like of of selling stuff? You've got to be thick-skinned because if you're actually interacting with the customer, people are not nasty, but When you walk around a shop, sometimes you go, oh, I hate that. You're just talking to the person you're with or like, I like that. And so you overhear these kind of conversations. And it was mostly good. But some people obviously don't get it, especially the rustic stuff I was doing. But there are a lot of work for uh, craft fairs. There's normally a fixed price for the stall. And then you need to do all the display stuff yourself. They normally provide a white plastic folding table. You can't just put your bits on it, look rubbish. You've got to display it. You need some kind of way of taking payment. Back then it was having a float, so you obviously got to go to the bank and get some cash, which they don't really like doing unless you've got a business account. These days you need a card reader, which obviously costs money. You've got to get there reasonably early and set up, and then it's a whole day's work. And I've done three in total now. Two, I've had a friend help me, which is so much better because if you want to go off to the the toilet or something or get some food, because you might be there for eight hours... You've, you've got someone else that can guard the stall. The last one I did was on my own, but they're normally a really friendly environment and you meet all the other stall holders and you just say, I'm popping off for a minute, can you keep an eye on things? And I do the same for them at the last one. I even sold a couple of bits for the stall next to me. That's invaluable. The networking I had at the last one, I think it was a really quiet event, unfortunately, and wasn't successful, but it was successful in another way because I spoke to everyone They all told me about other events, shops they sold in, and it was really good networking with other crafters. And actually coming face-to-face with your customer is also good. 
you kind of get feedback and even if people aren't buying you can see which products people are drawn to and which ones they're ignoring i never made a lot of money on them but they've always been an interesting experience and i don't regret doing them i suppose it could lead to commissions as well i guess if somebody sees something in the stall and says something along the lines of this is good but what about if it did this as well does that ever happen that's never happened to me but yeah i guess it could having business cards or flyers to give out probably be a good idea if that was the kind of thing you'd be interested in and then uh people got a way of contacting you i've got a friend called ross collins who runs a company called the sunny shed he used to be a dj so he's got a huge network of friends and people that know him through djing and he went into woodworking mainly making things uh, with scaffold boards making scaffold board furniture he did a lot of dj related stuff as well so he did units to hold records and um, turntables and things like that and he's turned it into a full operating successful business last year or the year before he even recruited an apprentice to work with him um, in his workshop and he had a list of orders on his blackboard he was really really very busy and that was all through word of mouth really Um, I think it definitely helps though if you're kind of that affable outgoing extroverted type Um, that's something that I think I would struggle with and and I think that's why I've always kind of leaned more into the online world of selling um, just because there's less interaction and there's less less reliance on word of mouth I guess. I would agree with that I'm not a salesman in fact I'm terrible at these craft fairs if people said oh I love this how much is it I would go oh just take it oh I'm so pleased you <laughs> like it so uh, online it's much easier to be a, a hard-faced business person than it is in person I find but it's it's all everyone knows their own strengths and what will work for them and your friend's business sounds great and I think uh, what he's also done well is carved out a niche for himself instead of going I'm a woodworker, it's I make things for DJs. Yeah. that Having cut something to specialist, I mean, maybe in the past you did a lot of um, cat-related things. I've done a lot of booze-related things. And it's good to have these little sectors to work in, I think. Yeah, and keeping things simple is, is definitely a good business practice as well because going back to my friend Ross, he pretty much just orders scaffold boards and a 338 millimeter diameter galvanized pipe that's pretty much all of the materials that he uses for all of his items that go out and obviously the tools he needs as well are relatively limited because he's literally just making um, similar items over and over again he does commissions and he does custom work but it's within the boundaries of those materials and i think that's a really sensible way of doing things um, for a business operation i suppose the downside of that is that you might get a bit bored doing the same thing and for me I think that's probably something that wouldn't appeal to me so much. I guess the uh, excitement of learning new skills and new methods of doing things is is kind of half of the appeal of getting into woodworking for me personally. Yeah, I'm the same. And I think that's one thing I love about doing YouTube is you can do something completely different each week. But still, running a business like that is probably a lot better for a lot of people listening than working their nine to five job. It's still being your own boss and making things and you can develop over time and bring new products in can't you but yeah to start off with having just very limited selection of tools and stock that you have to have on hand that is yeah very appealing and it means you can have a small workspace as well yeah and speaking of his workspace it's um it's kind of i would say probably single garage size but he's got a shipping container outside where he stores a lot of his materials Perhaps we can get him on the podcast one day. (laughs) Yeah, excellent. I suppose Carl Pope is another really good example as well of of somebody who has had success selling his work. I know that he's had similar frustrations in terms of commission work that has gone wrong for whatever reason. But generally, he's had no shortage of orders and he's been able to, you know, make a living from selling his work. And also he does his woodworking courses in evenings where he teaches people the basics of joinery and and woodworking and lets them then leave the workshop with a finished handmade item that they've put together themselves and that's worked really well for him. So in terms of commissions then Matt, have you had any good or bad experiences that kind of stand out that you could share with us? I guess my early ones were working with family and that was 
fine. It's, it's, it's typically the kind of, I've seen this thing on Pinterest, can you make it? But I had one that was an online commission for a table. And it's very difficult when someone writes to you with an idea of what they want. The idea that they have in their head might be completely different to how you envisage it. Even though I drew it out and sent them uh, plans, they were very happy with that. I made it and then they wanted to tweak this and then tweak that and chopping bits off and taking the finish off. And in the end, I, I budgeted, I think, two days for the build. And then I probably spent another two days with modifications. And I was like, I just don't want to do any more to it. That's it. I, there's only so many times you can sand something down and put a different finish on. <laughs> and it's in my mum's living room now. I just wrote it off as a project. Didn't send it to them. Didn't charge them. Kept it. It was a video. But yeah, I never want to do commissions. Yeah, I can see why. And um, I've had a very similar experience as well. Uh, it's funny for me... I would say probably nine out of 10 commissions have gone really smoothly and the buyer has ended up with an item that aligns with their vision and all is well. But there will be the occasion where either the customer is particularly fussy or they don't understand the amount of time and work that goes into making that thing. So I had a similar experience when I made a dining table and bench set. Um, that was a YouTube video as well. And it was a similar thing to you. The finish, I, I think he, the particular tint of the colour of the stain that I used wasn't quite to his uh, liking so I ended up having to strip it all I think I used a different stain in the end and then I scorched the wood slightly to try and get some of the red tone out of the stain because he wanted it to be quite a neutral brown color um, it, the whole thing was just a nightmare and you end up losing money because obviously you price up your time accordingly based on the amount of work that you expect to have to do you might add a small contingency in of 10 to 20 percent to cover any changes that might arise but you never really know if that's going to come to fruition. And obviously, to stay competitive, you want to price things relatively low to get the work. Um, it's it's a bit of a minefield, and I think one of the best ways to get around a lot of those issues is to have a set of terms and conditions. And I think when I had that nightmare project, I got a comment on my video. I think it was from Matt Berry Custom, who is a good friend of mine. He basically wrote a comment with all of the terms and conditions that basically say this is the item if you want to make any changes to that then you pay an additional fee i have to dig it out somewhere if i can still find that comment because there was some really valuable stuff on there but that was at a time when i was kind of winding down commissions because i was i was fed up with it much like yourself did you take a deposit because i've never done that but that seems the only security you'd ever have really yeah, usually I would take 50% up front. Um, so an another kind of bad experience I had was a dartboard uh, case. I wouldn't say it was a bad experience because the customer ended up being really pleased with the item. But I think I had underestimated how much um, control he wanted over the design. Um, he was quite particular about how he wanted it to look, the hardware that was on it and everything. So there was a lot of work just in emails between us trying to find, you know, nailing down exactly how he wanted it to look. And all of that obviously takes time. All of those emails back and forth, he even came round a couple of times to my workshop to actually see the progress that had been made and asked for changes. And there's so much time just in waiting for somebody to arrive and showing them around and all of that stuff. And again, none of that costing went into the, the price that I'd given him. So yeah, lots of learning experiences with commissions. And it sounds like you had no creativity in that project. You was just creating someone else's design, which I know for me is not the fun bit. And his early vision of the project was that he wanted it to be dark wood so I suggested the material I think I went for walnut veneered MDF for that one um, which was incredibly expensive I seem to remember I think it was about 70 or 80 pounds per sheet from my local timber yard I dread to think what that would be nowadays probably over 100 I should imagine but yeah you're absolutely right I didn't really get that much say into how it looked and the design I was okay with that at the time and I probably still would be now uh, it's just the, the hassle that goes with commissions that certainly put me off. Yeah, it's what moved me to online selling because then I create an item, people can buy it or not buy it, It's they can see it done. Most of the time there's no interaction with the customer whatsoever. I've just created an item and it sells or it doesn't sell. 
Yeah, there's no way of knowing what a customer is going to be like. If, if you've never met them before, you, you never know how that relationship is going to pan out in the long run. And that's that's the difficult thing. I mean, obviously, there's huge amounts of businesses where all their work is that. I suppose any kind of fitted furniture, but they, they must really have their terms and conditions and their procedures down. So when they discuss a project with the client, they're really on the same page before anyone starts. Yeah, and also, I guess um, it helps if you are quite... You, you kind of need to be able to make a stand for yourself, don't you? And, and stand up for yourself and, and argue the case. Yeah, I think you can be too nice. If you go into a situation going, do you like the colour? Do you want any changes? People are probably going to say they want changes because you're giving them that opening. That similar problem that we both had around stains and colour, um, I guess... What we should have done is caveated originally, this is the stain that I'm going to use, this is how it looks, here's a sample of it on the wood that I'm using so you can see exactly what it's going to look like and do all of that prep work ahead of time. I guess that's the the right way to do things. I, I had done all that. I'd spent time with the same wood staining it and photographing it and they'd picked it and then thought it looked different when it was on the finished piece. It's just never again. Yeah. <laughs> And it was at a time that I really couldn't afford to lose the £100 in materials either. But mm. got a video out of it, and that's the main thing. And a video and a lesson learned for me. I know that some people, in terms of job costs, will ask for just the cost of the materials up front. The 50% thing that I did was pretty much just plucked out of thin air. There wasn't much science behind it. Um, but it was it was always helpful just to know that there is some money there set aside to cover what you've done on it so far. The planning is a big thing and if someone comes to you and asks for a piece and you spend a day planning it and then they go, I'm going to go with someone else. I've got a friend who does, I forgot it was, he does a lot of garden buildings but I don't think it was something as big as that. I think it was a reception desk and some shelving for a hairdresser, something like that. He had gone and quoted, drawn up all the plans and then they'd come back to him and gone, oh, now my husband's seen all the plans, he reckons he can do it. But obviously he didn't think he could do it before. But now someone's actually drawn it all out for him with dimensions. So they've come and spent all that time quoting. Uh, but I don't know how you can possibly get around that. You can't charge for quotes. No. But it's just, it's such a minefield. And it definitely left a very bad taste in his mouth. Absolutely. I'm sure that happens a lot as well. I don't know if you've got anything like this where stuff that you've done on YouTube has led to potential commissions where you found niches in the market that I thought we might be able to share with others in case they want to start their own operation. Um, but I've had two experiences like that. One was kitchen worktop refinishing. I've had so many emails um, and, and for a while I did plenty of jobs. I must have had nearly a hundred messages about kitchen worked up refurbishments. Of course the downside of that is a lot of people that contact me are up in Scotland or somewhere like that and they're like, can you come and repair my workshop? It's like where are you based? Oh I'm in Dundee. Well not really, I'm down in Norwich and it wouldn't really be <laughs> viable for me to travel up. But I've got several jobs in Norfolk where I've gone ahead with them and it's worked out pretty well financially as well. And I've heard of other companies charging as much as 800 to to £1,000 to do a worktop refinishing job, which I think is extortionate. Um, I wasn't charging anywhere near that amount of money. They must have been using Osmo. <laughs> I had an Osmo horror story on one of the worktops that I, that I did. Because if they don't hate you enough at the moment. <laughs> I was thinking about doing a video about it. But then I thought, I don't want people to think that I hate Osmo because I don't. I think it's a fantastic product. I only hate the market dominance that they have. It's one of those companies that has the fanboys. Like you get the festival yeah. fanboys, you get the Osmo fanboys who totally. won't have a thing bad said against them. It's like, yeah, it's it's fine product, but there was other products as well that are just as good. Yeah, just for the record, I don't hate Osmo. I think they make brilliant products, but I also think there are other products that do just as good a job. So that'd be a great little business for someone to start then. Uh, I think so, yeah. Work tops. Because you could do it at weekends, couldn't you? Because people, when they're at home, obviously don't want to give tradespeople keys really or days off. So 
I don't know, how long would it take you? You could do it in a day? It's difficult to do in a day, but it is possible. I have done it. It's the sort of... But but the thing is, it doesn't take a whole day. It's just that most Mm. of that time is waiting for the finish to go off, Um, especially if you're using hard wax oil, because that can need Mm. four to six hours, um, ideally overnight. And, of course, there's the inconvenience of the person wanting to use the kitchen in that evening to make their dinner as well. So usually when I've taken on those jobs, I've kind of said get a takeaway tonight, I'll be back in the morning to finish up and then yeah. by that evening it'll be ready to use again. Ideally it's kind of like you need to do it in two visits, you need to mm. go there, scrape and sand, refinish, wait for it to go off, go home, come back, give it another coat and then you're done. Yeah and it was that experience that I had with the Osmo and on the last one that I did that put me off ever doing it again, but I won't go into detail on that here because it's just too long a story. Um, God, we're going to get so many comments going, we want that story. <laughs> I remember Andy uh, McKellen, he had talked about how he'd re a few bathrooms and how so many people wanted that done and you could have a whole business just re bathrooms. Yeah. Oh, doorbell, sorry. You all right? Sorry, wasn't expecting that one. No worries. But yeah, these kind of little businesses, how many tools do you need to refinish a kitchen or to silicon a bathroom? They're really low startup costs, aren't they? Yeah, and I think if you priced the jobs accordingly, especially with the worktop refinishing thing, you could probably just do two a week and make a good living. And you wouldn't need yeah. that many tools. You you just need a van, the basics and yeah you're away um but but it's knowing what those niches are that's the difficult part and it's only through having a youtube channel that i've found that there's so much demand for these particular Mm. businesses i did my mum's countertop in the summer and i've always watched you do them and use a um card scraper and i've never kind of understood why you use a card scraper to take it off rather than a sander and then i tried sanding off like a, a a film finish and it's like, oh, that's why you use a card scraper because <laughs> the, the the paper sandpaper just gets clogged up within thirty seconds. Yeah, and it doesn't do anything. You really got to scrape it. And I forgot what we used. It was something like um, a pallet knife. It was just like a kitchen utensil because I didn't have a card scraper, and that just scraped it all off. And then it could be sanded. But it's like, oh, why did I not trust Keith? I should have known this was not going to work. <laughs> I've never even tried um, just going straight to sandpaper, to be honest, but you could just imagine the amount of um, layers of oil that it's had over the years. People just desperately tried to oil it to to remove stains. And uh, yeah, scraping certainly seems to be the best way to go. No, it was the only way to go, I realised. Have I found any niches? It's not ones I think would be useful to people. I think after I made a dog bed, a lot of people liked that. But I, d- I think it's a saturated market. I, d- I don't think there's a lack of dog beds. Uh, the Hedgehog House, again, I made that and people were very interested in one of those. But you go on Amazon and you can buy them for 30 quid. Well, I couldn't even buy the wood to make one for 30 quid. So the one I made, if I was to actually, the cost of postage and the box and the packaging and the materials, I'd probably have to just charge £100 to make it worthwhile. And why would you pay £100 for one when you can get one that looks really nice for £30? Yeah. I made my mum a bath tray. Oh, yeah. And she said, oh, you should sell these. I'm like, well, as soon as you go on Amazon, there are 200 different ones, all for a tenner. Mm-hmm. How can I compete with using a wood that's good for the bathroom, so some kind of tropical hardwood that's cost a lot of money? No one's going to buy it. Yeah. It's pointless. I think a lot of woodworkers at the start think, I'll just make this thing and people will buy it. But you've got to make a thing that isn't available cheaper somewhere else. Yep. Or your thing has got to be so much nicer. Mm. But if you've just started, that's probably unlikely to be true. So finding a little niche is key. I made a lot of gin racks. Well, gin is popular, but isn't popular enough for any kind of big retailer to sell their own gin rack. So that was kind of a good one. It just had enough appeal, but not enough to be in Argos. Yeah. <laughs> But I think the kitchen worktop one, that sounds a great little one. And I think you could start that while still working full time. Because in theory, you could go over, especially in the summer, you could go over one evening and strip a worktop and then go over the next couple of days finishing it. And you, so you could still, it'd just be all extra money while you build up the business. 
Yeah, I don't know about you, but I've always got this fear that YouTube will just cease to exist one day randomly. And uh, I always had in mind this kitchen worktop refinishing business. But unfortunately, I've already given that idea to whoever's listening to this podcast now. So Yeah, we're going to delete this podcast and have to do it again now, aren't we? <laughs> the other niche I found was quite a strange one. I did a video three years ago about a worktop draining board um, that I made from Beach. But I had so many commissions through that. I sold so many draining boards because originally I just made one as a commission for a customer. And then I got loads and loads of emails saying I need the same draining board made. These are the dimensions. And I measured up and it was exactly the same as the one I'd already made. So I ended up making a batch of about 10 of them and they all sold very quickly. But those emails seem to have dried up now. I don't know why. Yeah, that's a bit of a strange niche, that one. Oh, that's interesting. Did you see the thing that Casual DIY made a few weeks ago? Yeah, I did with the router. I can't remember what it was. Was it a draining board? I think it was like one of those things that you put hot plates on. Possibly. Yeah, trivet type thing. That's right. Yeah, and it had kind of curved router. Um... I looked at it and like, I saw this thumbnail. I thought, I didn't know he had a CNC. <laughs> and then how he did it with the router was great. It definitely looks like it's something that has been CNC'd. Very impressive. It does. Yeah, it's a really good project, that. Yeah. We'll leave a link to that in the show notes for those that haven't seen it. Yeah. Hello, Matt here. Just interrupting to let you know we have a Patreon page. We don't earn any money from making this podcast and it takes quite a lot of time and money to prepare and produce each episode and we'd like to keep putting it out for free. If you'd like to help support it, there'll be a link to the page in the show notes or just search online for Workshop Banter Patreon We'd also like to say a big thank you to everyone who has signed up already. We really appreciate it. What about selling to shops? Is that something you've ever done? When I was in Hampshire, there was quite a few little crafty gift shops in town. I walked around town with one of my beer crates. Uh, I went to three different shops, I think. And by the time I got home, I had an email from one of them asking to stock four of them. And then they actually restocked them a few months later because they're very good for Father's Day and things like that. The trouble is, I think I'd said I was selling for £25 and then this might have been a year later and then got up to £30. But retailers want to be able to make 50% profit. So if you're selling for 30 they want to buy it off you at wholesale for 15 mm-hmm. You think of the profit left for you is not much and the effort of, oh, now I've got to drive into town and pay to park in the car park and try and walk through the streets carrying these big beer crates and drop them off and invoice people and... It's just, yeah, again, it's one of those things I thought that would be a good idea, but as doing it wholesale, I decided no. Unless you had some product, I don't know, like um, your rag and bone wax that you could really knock out 100 tins in a day and sell that in a shop, and then your profit margins don't have to be as good because you can make them so quickly. Yeah. The other thing I've tried to do in shops is you get kind of the craft and antique centre places where they call them stalls. Some may be as little as a cabinet or a little alcove or a little bit of the shop and you can rent that space. So I did that in like this little antiquesy crafty shop. First month I sold £120 worth of stuff. Not not amazing. I think they took 10%. So that's not a bad cost of doing business. And I think they wanted £20 a month or something. So like, okay, I could live with that. And I thought that's not bad for first month because I can work out what sells and what doesn't and the people in the shop were quite good at going yeah people are interested in this and not this but they got quieter every month and what I realised was their clientele because they had a cafe as well it'd be the same people come back every week so the first time I was in there it's like oh it's all new but then they'd seen it all before right and it was the December before uh, lockdowns I, I went away that Christmas came back in January went to see what we'd sold in December hadn't sold one item in December. Oh, no. And I'd really stocked up thinking, wow, this is prime Christmas sales. I was like, oh, it's pointless, this, and um, cleared it out. That's a good thing. You don't tend to sign long contracts with these people. You can just stop whenever you want. And as we went into lockdown a couple of months later, it was a perfect decision because I don't imagine the shop survived, actually. So, so far, craft fairs were a disaster for me. (laughs) Uh, commissions have been a disaster and physical retail have been a disaster (laughs) 
yeah, I've never had that experience, never had the craft fair experience either. Commissions, I wouldn't say, was a total disaster for me, but certainly I've had my fair share of bad ones to, to put me off doing it. I hope we haven't put everyone off <laughs> selling their work. Yeah, I think it's to play to your strengths. I, I think clearly we have similar kind of introverted personalities where maybe doing craft fairs and going around shops trying to persuade them to stock your things doesn't suit us. Yeah. But I love going to those kind of craft centre antique shops. That's something I do for fun. But I would say well over 50% of the time, I don't walk away with anything. Maybe some tea and cake in the cafe, but I do a lot of browsing and not buying. And I think those centres are full of people doing that. So we've both touched on the fact that we are both more comfortable selling online as opposed to offline, but there is that kind of hybrid of the two with Facebook Marketplace where you can list stuff online, but you also usually get to meet people to give them the item. What experiences have you had with Marketplace, Matt? I think I started with Facebook Marketplace by buying and selling tools. It's great for finding old tools but then back in the lockdown days I got into making mud kitchens I've done a video on it it's these kind of wooden kitchens you put in your garden it has kind of some kind of sink thing in it and kids make mud pies toy kitchen type thing they were popular because all other kid a- kids activities were kind of closed like the playground in my village was fenced off and you couldn't go and go to the cinema or do anything so I was selling quite a few of those profits weren't good on them but It kind of kept me busy in a quiet time and uh, gave me something to do. But also I got quite a lot of messages from people going, could they have it slightly bigger or smaller or different colour? So I did a few commissions, but people had already seen the thing and just wanted it tweaked a little. So that wasn't bad. You also get a lot of chances, I found, on Facebook. If you put something on £75, people will go, I'll give you 40 quid for it and I'll be there in an hour. Like, you coming really quickly is going to make you uh sell it and when i first started i would knock five or ten pounds off things and then i started actually pricing in that if you want to sell something for 70 quid put it on for 75 the more i sold the more confident i got and if anyone offered me anything i would just say no because i knew maybe in an hour or even the next day it would sell for the price yeah i think that's a little bit rude really i mean like i can i can understand bartering for some second hand item that someone wants rid of but for a handmade item i wouldn't have the confidence to say knock 10 or 20 percent off that but yeah no i think it's probably a good point for everything is know what your product's worth and believe that and stick to it yeah and i know a lot of people do well off um not facebook marketplace but facebook pages so you can set up a page for your business on facebook and sell items through that Part of the perk of doing it via Facebook is I think that you can advertise your items and get it in front of thousands of people for a few quid, basically, and make money that way. It's not something I've tried again, but I know a few people have had success with that model. And also, I've heard very good things about how Facebook adverts work in general, that you get good value for money in comparison to other forms of advertising. It's not something I have any experience with, as I say, but I've heard good things about it. Yeah, I've not tried it and I've always been reluctant to pay for advertising because it's it's notoriously hard to know if it ever works. So have you sold anything on Marketplace yourself then? Never listed anything on Marketplace other than secondhand items that I need rid of. Um, I wouldn't put anything that I've made on Marketplace just purely for the reasons that you've mentioned already. I don't want to get the price knocked down and I'll just feel offended. Yeah, it's people want to bargain on Marketplace Another thing that I've heard people have success with is the whole Google businesses thing um, where you can basically set up your business on Google and get work from it. Um, So a good example is my brother recently started a business where he's doing PC repairs and computer related stuff. He listed his business um, on Google. I don't think there was any cost either and he got about four jobs within the space of two weeks just from that Google listing. So is that when you go on Google Maps and you zoom in quite a lot and you see all these businesses pinned, they're clearly just houses. Are they all Google businesses? So, oh yeah, that's interesting. But at the same time, I wouldn't want someone to be able to look up Badger Workshop and just know exactly where I lived on Google Maps. 
yeah, it doesn't doesn't work for YouTubers really. But um, if you're setting up as a uh, commissions and woodworking, it's still saying here's a guy that has thousands of pounds worth of tools and here's his address. <laughs> that's true. That, that's the downside of it, I guess. It's called Google Business Profile. I've just looked it up. So those were some of our experiences selling offline or in the real world. In the next episode, we're going to focus on selling online. Thanks for listening. You can find Keith on YouTube by searching for Rag and Bone Brown and me by searching for Badger Workshop. We have a Patreon page. If you'd like to help support us making future episodes of the podcast, link to that is in the show notes. And we also have a Workshop Banter Instagram and Facebook page at Workshop Banter, all one word, if you'd like to get in touch with us. Thanks for listening.